challenge in running through command prompt it's because while installing while installing uh, you have to ensure that you are checking on that path set path i think most probably the third step or second step when it asks you do you need to set the path one second so you have to set that path there so it will automatically set it up if not you have to manually do that uh, so every uh, os like every any version of windows os has the system environment variables which you can access search and access it so you have this path right so in this path variable they have added this here see c users anaconda 3 c users anaconda 3 some other folder and so on right so this i didn't add manually this got added because of the installation because of the installer So just make sure that you're checking that out. That's it. All right. No. See, if you are uh, setting this path, you don't have to do that. That's what I'm saying, right? If you're setting this path, you don't have to do that. So, like for instance, see, like how I'm opening it from any place. So, like, so I'm an E drive. another folder so i am launching my command prompt from here like Rhyme. file open command prompt so i am i am directly in this path or maybe like if someone opens a command prompt like this so go directly to the e drive change your directory to whatever folder you want so now you are in that particular folder right so from here just run jupyter space notebook that's it So this will work if you have set the path. This is what I'm saying, right? If not, you all guys know. You guys know how DOS works, right? So if that is not working, every time you run it, you have to just uh, set path. If you set path is equals to whatever is your installation, like C users username Anaconda three. and like that you have to set multiple paths every time you do it but that, that that's not good enough right so for once set it up in your path folder that's it right all right let's wait for two more minutes before we start now after visiting the website you got to log in and for login details and all just check your email id you would have got the uh, instructions to login right so log in with your user id and password my password is not password i have changed it so <laughs> so now as soon as you open it up like you see as soon as you open it you are taken into the current courses tab right so in the current courses itself you can find it so as of now i have not added this exact course but like let's say uh somebody is taking uh okay somebody is taking this course here called data science using sas and r for example so that's your current course for example so that is visible under this current courses tab and you just have to click on classes right you see this class is 32 uh, 32 classes in this course you have to click on view that's it here you see upcoming classes previous classes self paced classes so this is not a self paced course right this is a live course so you will find it under previous class recordings just hold on i'll show you that example so let me go to any past course for example so let's say uh, i'm opening a python old batch for example so you can find everything under your previous class recordings in your current course tab <coughs> find everything under your previous class recordings folder and you can find the video there and also just below it one second it's loading up just below that you can have this link to download reading documents don't click here just right click and open it in new tab right you'll get this in new tab whatever is the material shared so it can be a simple pdf like you can see here or usually it's a zip file 
one second let me show that to you. so usually if it is a zip file then uh, uh one second yeah it's a zip file so this is what you would see don't click on this folder just go and download this first right if you click on this folder you will uh, keep uh, looking out for the download button which you will never get so as soon as you open this one right you see the main file name python class 1.zip just click on download download direct download it gets downloaded right simple as that so as you can see this is your first python class let's say for example this is your first python class I'm just pausing it first python class and correspondingly you will have your documents for that particular class should there be any other reference video that will appear just below this right let's say uh, uh, like the class is a little bit complicated and uh, we want to put one more instructors or other trainers video from an analytics lab so we would do that here right or maybe let's say uh, there is some net uh, network disruption and uh, the video got split i mean like you know you got disconnected and the recording got split so we'll have two parts of the videos all available under one tab called class like this is class 2 you'll have all under the class 2 right all right if you have not missed the material don't worry like uh, most probably by today evening every material will be uploaded now coming to today's class what did we do yesterday so where did we stop type casting okay so what was our actual agenda yesterday like uh, we were about to discuss till data types right so now let's start with conditionals and loops so today's agenda would be i'm just putting everything in one single uh, notepad in this uh, i'll just put the date like sunday 9th september <laughs> conditionals loops data structures this is a point of discussion today right conditional loops and data structures <clears throat> What do you understand by conditionals? <coughs> Applying conditions, right? This is what we mean by conditionals. Conditionals are those statements which have power to, you know, uh, alter the flow of code, right? So based on condition, you will have two directions, right? So that is what is conditional says. Do you know any conditionals? Most of you are from programming background. If else, fantastic. If 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 then else is the standard conditional statement. So, yeah, select case. Yes, that is also one of the good uh, statements here. While is a loop. While is a conditional loop. Conditional loop. So yes, if then else, select case or switch case. Yes. So those are our standard conditionals. Now in Python, you have if conditions. If, else if, and ternary if. These are the three things available in Python. What I'll do now is I'll write a simple C language if statement. Everybody, please pay attention. My target is I have a variable called x. And I want to check if x is positive or negative. Simple as that. So how do I write it? So in C language, if x greater than zero, bracket starts, uh, printf, positive. And uh, else, printf negative, and that's it, right? It would be a nightmare if you forget those uh, semicolons, right? So this is your C code. Now, your if statement in Python looks almost like this. Just remove those curly braces. Now, coming to that, <coughs> this is a practically correct statement. Everybody agrees to this? Yes or no? 
this is also syntactically correct statement right yes or no both are syntactically correct am i right or wrong online guys do you agree with it this and this both are syntactically correct in a language like c or java or c++ right right yes or no take a careful look at this now yes i would say like this is more civilized this you know there are some specimens who do this who deserve a high five on their face with a chair right so this is a good way of writing code indentations proper indentations now what what python has done it it has seen like no programmers follow the uh, indentation uh, uh, what do you say courtesy of indentation what python did is it made indentation as a part of syntax without a indentation your syntax is wrong you have an incorrect syntax if you are not putting up those indentations right that's your python syntax that's the reason why i had written a c code to explain you the importance of white spaces in python right now let us write the python if statement so your python if statement looks exactly like this i'll get back to my notebook so create some number let's say x is equals to minus uh, 10 whatever now let's say if just look at the uh, syntax that's it if x greater than 0 now in a c language or java you start your block with a curly brace agreed yes most of the languages follow that rule right in python you will follow the block the start of a block is denoted using colon just remember that so if x greater than 0 so i'll just write that here start of a block <coughs> is denoted by a colon right see automatically uh, this editor is putting up that four space indentation right exactly four spaces yeah four space mandatory no mandatory it's a, it's essential right so i'll say print सिद्धार्थ एंड रिंकू प्लीज म्यूट यूर सेल्स और So this is clear to everyone. Yes. So you get the answer. Like x is minus ten, hence negative. Clear with this. All right. Can you not write the initialization and the code in one single section? Initialization as in? X equals to minus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do that. Do that. I can do that. Yes. Of course, I can do that. I've just written it in separate lines also. Without indentation, it's a clear syntax error, right? One, two, three, no, four. Yes, right. You should give that. Code looks beautiful, actually. It's a, it's, a, it's a syntax rule that code should be looking beautiful, just like South Korea, actually. In India, we are fed up with uh, you know fairness cream ads. South Korea, you have commercials that talk about plastic surgery and uh, what not. I'm not talking about the North one. North is peaceful still. The South Korea, actually. All right. Uh, moving on. Let's write uh, a nested if, right? Shall we? Same logic. I want to check if x is positive, negative, or zero. Simple as that. I'm mean, like, I'm not taking any complicated example. Here, what's important is you understand the syntax. That's it. So let's do that so first i'll say if x equal to equal to 0 then print 0 just look at the way how i'm writing it else if x greater than 0 print positive else 
print negative right i hope everybody understood what i have written here yes there is this if block if and then block then comes the else block which contains another if else block right and look at the indentations they be proper right four space indentation is mandatory please don't forget that is that clear all right so you have got negative clear with us now you have something called else <coughs> if the portmanteau of else and else right so the exact statement what i have written here it can be rewritten using else and else or lf without writing else if separately i can do it by using the keyword lf now how do i do that please listen so if x equal to equal to 0 then print 0 that's fine now here is to writing else i'm going to write lf and when i'm writing lf which means i can check for one more condition here and what is the other condition x greater than 0 then i'll print 0 sorry uh, print positive now this lf can have one more else statement right because there is an if over there which can be followed by another lf or another else right so print negative that's it i hope you have understood the syntax between both right is this clear to everyone simple stuff just pay attention to the syntax how you use it later it's up to you pay attention to the syntax that's enough as of now right all right final else is mandatory not mandatory it all requires on your logic this is also good enough right this is also good enough but according to the logic i need it right right so that's why i have put an else over there as a matter of fact else is not at all mandatory you know that right if a condition is satisfied then do something that's it that is what is if basic if statement is now next is ternary if it's not called ternary if exactly but uh, let's call it ternary if for our uh, you know remembrance purpose so how many of you have done excel uh, how many of you have not done excel online guys <laughs> done it how many of you have not done it Now, anyways, why I'm asking that is, let's say in Excel, I have a statement called if, right? How does that work? So, if condition, if condition, value if true, value if false, right? So, this ternary if works in a similar way. In fact, what we have written in Excel is a ternary if. what do you have in excel is a ternary if excel is not a programming language right it's a formula based language i mean like it's a formula based tool actually it has vba that's a different story but yes basically excel without vba is a formula based language right so this is a ternary if in excel right and why i'm say why i'm giving you the excel example is most of you are familiar with excel and if someone is not get yourself familiarized with excel because there is a thumb rule i mean like the person who taught me analytics he used to say like one who doesn't know excel has no right to stay in this domain right so you have to know excel if you don't know anyways moving on so let me let's let's write this kind of a thing in python how do we write it so i want to print if x is positive or negative simple right so you please look at this i'll say print i cannot say print i'll say positive can i directly print positive can i directly print positive i can't do that right it doesn't make sense so i'll print positive if x greater than 0 else print negative so what is the answer now negative because it is doing as per instructed so if we can uh, 
isolate this particular statement here for your reference. Please take a careful look at this. I'm saying it's positive if x greater than zero, else negative. That's your ternary. Simple as that. Clear? Yes? Let's do the complete example, positive, negative or zero, right? So I'll say zero if x equal to equal to zero, else say positive. Is this correct? If x equal to equal to zero, then zero, else positive. Is this correct? No, when can I say it is positive? Yes. Else positive if x greater than zero, else negative. That's it. I hope it is clear to everyone. Yes, right? Uh, Rajesh, can you tell me what is this code doing? The code which I have highlighted, can you please tell me what it is doing, Rajesh? Abhishek, uh, here we go. Here is where your X is coming from. Why we need this ternary if when we already have if else statements? Why do we need Python when we already have Java, R, SAS, and other languages? So ternary if is present just for your I mean like just for your help. Like in case you want to use this logic, you can use ternary if, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're unable to unmute. Just a second. Yeah, I think uh, the first is the uh, we are checking the value whether x is positive. Yes. If that is the case, the next statement uh, uh, that is uh, <coughs> greater than zero. I'm sorry, uh, please. So see, positive if x greater than zero. Guys, please listen, everyone. Positive if x greater than zero, else negative. Simple as that. Here in, in this statement, what we are doing is we are saying zero if x equal to equal to zero, else positive. But this is not a complete one, right? We'll have to add some more, right? Some more, one more logic we have to add here. And what is that logic? Positive if x greater than zero, else it is negative. Just if you can imagine one, uh, you know, kind of a bracket here. See, now I think this is more clear, right? This entire thing which is present in the bracket is one part. The else part of your first if. And oh, this okay. else part contains one more conditional check inside it, right? Okay, okay, great. Sir, uh, regarding this uh, ternary if that you have mentioned, uh, yeah. if condition value true and value false, right? Within that bracket, regarding exactly. the ternary if. Exactly. Sir, in this, which is the condition print uh, PO positive if x is greater than zero, that is the condition you mean to say? Yeah, that's the condition, of course. Okay, okay, fine, fine. All right. Okay. I got it. Thank you, thank you. All right, all right. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, any other questions online, guys? Online, guys, any other questions? All right. So it's not the scope of the declaration. Is it only limited to this window? Which one? Uh, so this one is available throughout the code. In this code window. Yeah, 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 of course. That is quite obvious, isn't it? So what's the definition of a global variable? So it is available within that same code. So scope and all we'll see that in detail in the next class like how what is private variable uh what is the lifetime what do you understand by scope it's not required that depth is not required for us 
but still we'll see it right because like in future if we may write some uh, you know minor tweaks for our algorithms like let's say uh, you're using for example you're using a naive bias algorithm for example so eventually you'll understand what is naive bias algorithm right and you'll see what is the purpose of it how the code works now if you want to modify this algorithm for yourself according to your needs right so in that case you must understand like you must know how to create a class or at least how to create a function how to use variables inside a function uh, and uh, till how long those variables will exist where can you access those variables and most important how to secure your variables you know you create a class and you hide your data you don't want to uh, you know have it for access for everyone no one else should access it right so all these things you will own sure that so next class we'll see that if not in absolute detail but yes the outer part of it right and we'll try to make some classes so at that time we can know about scope and visibility of variables right all right oh uh, there is no limit there is no limit for uh, the ternary if right no 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 there is no limit you can use elif can't be used here elif can't be used here it's it's just if else that's it that's the reason like if i had to use elif i'll go for this kind of a code here right is it possible to execute only a single line in a cell in your python notebook uttam that is the meaning of a cell you're not supposed to write multiple lines if you wish to write it you can write one block of code don't write multiple lines of code there's a difference right between block of code and lines of code so you can write it in separate lines right uh, is there a difference in the efficiency of the code between ternary and elif uh none as such none as such okay uh now that being said let's look at loops now what are loops now what do you understand by a loop or itinerary uh, iteration or itinerary statements so it repeats loops are of two types iterative statements are of two types range based iterations and condition based right all right so the most famous range based iteration is the for loop Is that clear? The for loop. The while loop is condition-based iteration. I'll give you a brief example of both. So let's say x is equals to one, for example. I'll say while while x. You know, I uh, for while I need a uh, bracket, so I'll say while. X less than equal to ten. For example, how do I denote the start of a block? Colon. I'll say while x less than ten, I'll say print x multiplied by let's say three. For example, for example, so one into three, two into three, three into three, four into three, and so on till ten into three. And now I'm changing the value, so I'll say x. Which is one as x is equals to x plus one. So in the loop itself, keep increasing the value of x till when you will do till this condition is satisfied, right? So run it. So till x is equals to ten, the loop runs. Afterwards, it breaks up. Clear? I hope this is clear to everyone. Okay. <clears throat> indentation is mandatory in every part of Python, actually. So whenever you are writing block, indentations are mandatory. Please do not forget that. It's a mandatory rule to have indentations. All right. Uh. So this loop runs until unless the condition is true, right? 
never do this never write a statement like this i hope everyone understands what this will loop right what is this this is an infinite loop because it's always true and uh, it keeps on going actually so while i was in btech like we had these old systems for our c lab very old legacy systems and they used to make that peculiar uh, sound whenever it runs into this infinite loop condition so some kind of a creepy music actually so now i keep doing this i'm like it's it's you know natural for me to you know experiment and all that right so when that sound comes we used to have a very sweet lab assistant ma'am no matter which corner of the globe she is in when she hears that sound she comes in no matter where the sound comes from she comes to me kicks me out of the lab right so we have done a lot of such mischiefs in childhood but not many more not in the office don't do that so never write these kind of a codes here right that's an infinite loop anyhow moving on let's get into the for loop how do you write a c style for loop can anyone tell me this online guys can anyone tell me how to write a c style for loop or java style for loop online guys can you please type it and send it in the chat box the c style for loop yes absolutely let's get so for i is equals to 1 i less than equal to 10 then i plus is equals to 1 not plus 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 is equals to 1 right so this is your for loop clear with us what is happening here we are actually generating some range of numbers right this particular code here is responsible to generate a range 1 2 3 4 till 10 right so in python in python the for loop breaks down into two parts one where you are generating this range two where you are using this range in for loop right so let's first see how to generate ranges how to generate ranges for that i have a very simple function called range that's it range one so let's say let's say i'll i'll begin from 1 comma 10 comma increment by 1 clear there is a small problem here why this code will not generate numbers from 1 to 10 so what i'm expecting i'm expecting numbers 1 2 3 4 so on till 10 right so there is a small problem here this function will not generate numbers till 10 this will go only till 9 so if i can just writing this i'll explain this to you later what i have written so this is only generating numbers from 1 till 9 it is not including 10 so just remember one thing in python in any range operation range operation means range function like this or any other place where you are getting range by any other method that you will see in uh, next few minutes right in any range operation the uh, end point is not inclusive the end point or lower upper bound the upper bound is not inclusive so that's the reason why range 1 to 10 will generate numbers till 9 10 is not inclusive whatever you have mentioned will not get included uh, how do i get numbers from 1 to 10 11 i should put my end point as 11 now i'll get numbers from 1 to 10 right and what does this one stand here for increment or decrement so if it is an increment i'll say like 2 for example so that's an increment so 1 1 plus 2 3 3 plus 2 5 5 plus 2 7 7 plus 2 9 9 plus 2 11 11 is not inclusive right i have mentioned 11 but 11 is not inclusive so it will not include 11 it prints up to 9 when i'm incrementing it by 2 when i'm incrementing it by 1 
it prints till 10 because 10 plus 1 is 11 11 is the end point so it is not included right now let's write a for loop right so please look at the syntax i'll say for i in range 1 comma 10 1 comma 11 increment by 1 that's it clear for i in range that's it so now i'll say print i'll say print i multiplied by 3 like we did before so you will get up to 10 right 3 into 1 3 into 2 up to 3 into 10 that's it i hope this for loop is also clear what's more important for you to remember is to remember this range function that's it is that clear right if I want to increment uh, i again, yeah. increment i again, like right? Uh huh. So you'll say i is equals to i plus one. Of course, man. Of course, of course. Because you incremented in the for loop itself. Yes. So here you increment increments from that number. One from that number. Yes. Indexing is not here. Range always starts from zero. Not necessarily. Not necessarily range starts from zero. All right. And there is a small uh, drawback with range function. The drawback is range cannot generate a range cannot uh, increment or decrement by a decimal value. You cannot increment or decrement by decimal value. So how do you overcome it? There are other functions in a package called numpy which can do that. I hope that is clear. There are other functions in numpy package which can do that. But range function cannot increment or decrement by a decimal value. Right? That's the small drawback of range function. If you're expecting that, you can't do it. So in future, when once we get into numpy, at that time again I'll do a for loop. And that time I'll be using some decimal increment. Right? Like generating numbers from 0 to 1 incremented by 0 0.1, for example. You can't imagine that using range uh, operator here. Is that clear? Every one of you? Okay. There is no start and end of the statements that is a feature executed in the code. I can see the basis right. Now you mentioned print i into 3. Uh -huh. What if I have multiple other instructions going there? Pardon? I, what? If I mention print i goes to i into 10, uh -huh. like a statement, would it include that also? Of course, why not? So there is no end to it. There is no end to it, hasn't? See, first of all, I multiplied by 10. So I is 1, right? 1 into 3 is 3. 1 into 10 is 10. Next increment. 2 into 3 is 6. 2 into 10 is 20. Next increment. 9 into 3. 9 into 10. Sorry, 3 into 3 and 3 into 10. That's it. Why there will be a limit? There should be some point where the follow stops. Oh, okay, okay. So like, for example, so come back four steps. That's it. So if I say print, loop is done. So this is not a part of your loop, right? Okay, there is dead space, uh, there is no mm -hmm. part of the loop. This how does follow understands that we are just the end of the statement? Indentations. Okay. Indentations. That's a good question, actually. How do you understand that you have ended the block? Start of the block is being denoted by colon. What denotes an end of a block? That's a very good question there. Guys, everyone. So the end of a block is denoted by a back indentation. That's it. Come four spaces to the left. Or in other words, decrease the indentation. That's it. You're ending the block. So this loop is done. Print statement will not repeat 10 times. Does it? No, it doesn't. So let me, let's check it out. No, it only executes once. And that after the loop is completed. Clear with us, right? The same applies to my loop also, right? 
Yeah, yeah, for anything. Let's say you're writing an if statement here. Let's say I've written an if statement here. I want to write something else. I want to put a for state for loop here. So I'll say for i in range something. All right? So that's a different, different block altogether, right? I hope you're understanding it all, right? So that's a different block together. So how did I, how did I denote the end of a block? Four spaces back, right? Back indentation. Decrease the indentation by four steps. That's it. Clear? Online guys, I hope you have understood the question and the answer, right? Pardon? Yeah, decrement is minus one. So in that case, let's say for example, range 10 to zero, for example, minus one, right? To look at those numbers, just use this list function. I'll explain what is list function. So this is your decrement, right? Again, see the lower bound is not included, right? So it includes the starting point. It will never include the end point. Is that clear? All right. Is there any way to include zero here? So yes, my end point should be minus one. Now zero gets included. What is this last minus one for? Decrement, right? So what is the generic uh, syntax of range function? Range, start point, whatever is your end point, whatever is your end point, just add one to it, right? And increment or decrement, clear? Uh, uh, uh. So that's about uh, conditions and loops, right? Of the uh, most important parts of, you know, your program. Now let's discuss data structures. So in object oriented programming, in object oriented programming and in data science, both, you need a storage mechanism, right? You need to know two things actually. Point number one, we need to know what kind of information we have, what kind of data we have. That's most important thing for us to know. And that is also most important for our statistics. Like what kind of information? Is this a number? Is that number discrete or continuous? Is it a categorical variable? Or is it a simple text variable? Categorical variable as in variables with categories, variables that represent categories like uh, grades, pay scale, or age group, right? And simple text variables like name, name doesn't have any statistical significance, name of a person, especially, it doesn't have any statistical significance, right? So is it a simple text variable? Or things like address, for example, address has some data inside it, but you can't do any kind of statistics on address, right? So address is a simple text variable. So you need to identify what kind of information you have, right? Second thing, you also need to understand, you need to understand how that information, how that data is being stored. Is it a variable like X is equals to 10? Is it a variable or is it a table? Is it a table like we have in Excel or SQL? Is it a table or is it a matrix? A two dimensional matrix or is it an one dimensional array? How is it stored? Right? How is it stored? So that is what is important for us, right? Why is why is the second point so important for us? Or in fact, why is these two points very important for us? Because what are we doing? We are doing something called data mining, right? We are more interested in doing this exploratory data analysis or data mining in short. So if you want to do data mining, we must be able to 
extract information that is our first goal right extract information and we should be able to apply or filter apply conditions or apply filters on our data select all records from my main table where location equal to equal to bangalore so those kind of filters we should be able to apply right so for that we must need to understand how the data is being stored clear with this so the first point we have already discussed yesterday your data types you have to have a mechanism how you understand your data types how is it being stored now let's understand that right i have used the word array array is a very generic word what do you understand by an array guys what is an array pardon group of elements group of data so if i simply say x is equals to 10 that's one simple variable but what if i have a mechanism like if i have x1 that can store multiple values so this thing is storing multiple values right so this is known as an array in general right now let's see how python identifies them what is an array in general again it's a one dimensional data structure all right we can say that so in python we have three different one dimensional heterogeneous data structures we have three different types of one dimensional heterogeneous data structure this is what basic python provides us in basic in base python we have three different one dimensional heterogeneous data structures is that clear this point is clear to everyone right now uh, now just uh, help me to understand what do you understand by heterogeneous <laughs> different types of data hetero heterogeneous means different data types so it can, that one dimensional array can be a mix of numbers text dates booleans everything is that clear what are those data structures number 1 is a tuple number 2 is a list number 3 is a dictionary so set and dictionary right these are the three data structures provided by python is that clear to everyone now 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 no so let's uh, begin with tuples now when we are discussing these three things what do we need to know what do we need to know we need to know one how to create them to extract elements number 3 apply conditions right number 4 what are its attributes or you understand the attributes properties properties or functions that's attributes right so let's see let's begin with tuple let's first understand how do you create a tuple right that's our first job let's do that to create a tuple we need to use parentheses round brackets so let's create this i'll copy this statement here and paste it here is so according as x1 let's call it as t1 or tup1 which is tuple yes so if i'm running the statement this directly creates a tuple All right we don't even need to use the round brackets the statement that i have written here directly creates a tuple see when i am running this 
Look at the output. A tuple got created and it is stored in a variable called tap one. Yes. If you want to look at type of tap one, it's definitely a tuple. Right? Is this good, everyone? Yes. All right. Yes, of course, you can use round brackets as I have mentioned before. That is also doable. You can just enclose everything within round brackets. That also creates a tuple. That's this is actually the main way of creating tuple. However, you can also do it in this manner without mentioning any kind of brackets. Just keep mentioning elements separated by comma. Exactly. So what is the conclusion of all these things? What is the default one dimensional data structure in Python? Tuple. Right? Although it has given me three or four different options, the default one is tuple. Let me make it four actually. Let's put dictionary separate to a set. Clear with this? So out of the four different data types available, data structures available, tuple is the most default one and basic one. Clear with this? All right. So that's how you create it. Let's see how do you extract elements out of a tuple. What do you understand by extracting elements? Yes. Fetching an element by its index. Right? Grabbing an element by its index. Now tell me one thing. Indexing or positions index. Indexing in Python begins with fantastic. Indexing in any language begins with zero. Right? That's basic. Now let's do this. Extract fifth element. What's the index? Very good. What's the index of fifth element? Element uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Fifth element. Index is fifth element. Index is four. Zero, one, two, three, four. Right? Fifth element index is four. Yes, online, yes, absolutely correct. Most of you. So, how would I say this? Top one square brackets four. This extracts the fifth element. First, second, third, fourth, fifth. So, what's the index? Zero, one, two, three, four. Right? What does this do? What does a minus sign do? Very good. So what if if I say top one square brackets minus four? What does this do? Uh, yes. So if this is four, I mean like element with fourth index or you know fifth element. from the left hand side so this is fourth element from right hand side say so zero right minus one minus two minus three minus four right zero there can't be minus zero right so from here it is minus one, it begins with minus one. So minus one, minus two, minus three, and minus four. Which is zero, zero. The element is zero here in my tuple, right? What does the minus sign do then? Start from the right hand side, that's it. Let's say I want to extract first four elements. So what's their indexes? What, what will be their indexes? Zero, one, two, three. Four, no, zero, one, two, three, right? 
So see, how do I write it? Using range function, how do I generate 0, 1, 2, 3? Range 0, 3, right? Why 4? Exactly, because we need to include this 3, right? So we'll put 4 here. So 0, 4, 1. So that will print a range from 0, 1, 2, 3, right? Now, please look at the code here. Tap 1, square brackets, 0, colon, 4. What does it uh, extract? Uh, First four. Zero, one, two, three. That's it. Because zero colon four generates numbers from zero, one, two, three. Four is not included. Is that clear? So we don't need it for you to expect the error. Yes. Very good. That's that's a very good observation. No, we don't need for loop. Pardon? 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 Yeah, we can we can we can use this uh, colon to split. Yes, we can have multiple elements extracted as well, right? Now please look at this statement here. Up one. Now, how many? How many? Elements are there in tuple top one. How many elements are there in top one? How do I how do I know that? Len. Len. Fantastic. So I have a function called len. Len top one. So it says how many number of elements are present in top one. Extract all odd indexed values. I'll extract all values from odd indexes. How do I do it? What do you mean by odd index? Here, 1, 3, till 15. 15 should also be included, right? Yes? So how do I do it? Exactly. I can use increment or decrement, that kind of thing, right? So let's see how it is done. Everyone, please pay attention here. Tough one. Is zero an odd number? One. One, right? So I should begin with one. Colon, one second. So if I go till 15, the problem is 15 doesn't get included. So I'll put 16. It's okay to put 16. Don't uh, think that I'm out of bounds. Because if I do top one square bracket 16, then I'm out of bounds. Right, because the total length is 15, which means the indexes are from 0 to 14. So in that case, if I'm putting top one square bracket 16, then that's out of bounds. Here it is not, right? So, okay, uh, not, not just 16, like what are the number of elements here? Till 15, right? So 0, 1, 2, 3, till 14 and a half, right? All the odd indexes till 14. So what should I do? I'll put 15 here. I'll just put 15 here, right? Now, comma, sorry, colon, 2. So now that increments by 2. What is the answer of this? So what are the indexes that are being generated here? 0, sorry, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. That's it. 13 plus 2 is 15, which is not included. See this? Right? I can also put 14 here, the last element, which is still not, which, which still can't be included, right? 13 plus 2 is 15, which is not inclusive, right? So please look at the answer now. The elements from the given positions here gets extracted, right? All right, guys, is this clear? And likewise, for this case exactly, extract all even indexed values. So if I can just copy the above statements. This should start from 0. If I'm putting 14 here, there is a small problem. See, if I'm starting from 0 till 14, so 0 plus 2 is 2, then 4, then 6, then so on till uh, 12 plus 2, 14, doesn't get included, right? I want to include 14 here. So that's why I'll put 15. 
15 as my end point because I want to have 14 in my data. So this will make sure that 14 is also included. Right? Here we go. Right? Even positions, odd positions. The next step is apply conditions. Now this needs a loop. You can't do it in square brackets. Applying condition needs loops. Clear with this? Let's apply some conditions. Extract all elements from tuple one that are greater than let's say 40. Clear. Shall we do it? Let's do that. I'll select print all elements. Not extract. I can't extract. I can just print them for a tuple. Print all elements from tuple one that are greater than 40. Let's do that. For I in now just tell me what should I do here? Why? So I need positions, right? From zero till length minus one. What is the length of tuple? 15. Zero to 14. I need to loop. Then I'll use square brackets. In square brackets, I'll pass i. Sounds good, right? Yes or no? Everyone? Let's try that for i in range 0 to length of top 1, right? Increment by 1, colon. I'll simply say print top 1 square brackets i. That's it. So all the elements are printed, right? Yes or no? Which means I'm able to extract all the elements, right? Using the indexes. Is this clear to everyone? All of you understood the simple code snippet, what I have done. I have looped from all the index ranges. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Then I have extracted all the elements using the square brackets. Is this clear to everyone? I'll say print top one if top one of i greater than 40. Else, uh, else, else, continue. No, does not work. No, oh, why is this thing not working? So let me let me let me do it in normal if manner. So I'll say if. Top one square brackets i greater than 40, then print. Right? That's it. So we'll print all the elements which are greater than 40. Is this understood? Yes? Sir, so the first line of the code, what mm -hmm. does that length top one mean? It is uh, taking a number of elements. Which one? The length, length uh, top one. What is length doing? It number should count number of elements. That's it. Right. And then it, so it is incrementing by one. Like it is extracting the first element, then second, then third. No, 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 no. So in the end, I put a note. This one. Ah. Guys, can I even explain this clearly? It's like zero to the thing, and then increment by one. That's it. If you don't give, also the default increment is by one, anyways. Yes, exactly, Radhesh. You're absolutely correct. Range of indexes from 0 to length of tuple. All right. Now, can you please look at the next statement that I'm about to write? Keep that in mind. Now, also keep this in mind, whatever I'm writing. For i in top 1. Print i. Can anyone point out the difference between the above statement and below statement? Both are exactly same, right? So here in this case, I'm going for the ranges. Here I'm going for the 
direct tuple. Here I contains the ranges. I here contains ranges. Hence I'll have to use square brackets I inside of my code. Here I directly contains the element, the tuple element, individual element of a tuple. I don't have to use those square brackets here. Understood the difference? Right? So you can use, I mean, like the, the reason why I have told you both the options is it's all based upon situations. In this case, you can imagine this, you can imagine writing this, but there are some cases where you have to write a code like this, right? Getting into the ranges. So you must know both of them, right? Is that clear? So what was the previous code here? How did I write it? If top one of I greater than 40, right? Here, what should I write? If I greater than 40, simple as that. If I greater than 40, because in this case, I happens to contain the elements of tuple, that's it. If I greater than 40, then print I. That's it. That's it. That's all. It's done. Clear with this? Yes, everyone? Fantastic, Anil. That's, that's the correct answer. We wish to have one more example. Let's have it. Uh, print elements from top one, which are greater than 40 and less than 80. So that's simple for I in top one. If I, yes, exactly, I greater than 40 and I less than 80. Then print I. Clear with us? All right. So this is about applying conditions. Let's see what are it at what are its attributes? How to look at attributes? How to look at attributes of any object? So yesterday, if you remember, I had taken a string as a str1 is equals to Python class, for example. That's a string, right? If you look at the type, it's a string. Or if I take a number, n1 is equals to 5 plus 6j. What is n1? It's a complex number. TUP1 is a tuple. How do you look at attributes of all these elements? Look at this. The answer to this question is we use the DIR function. We use the DIR function for that. DIR lists all the uh, internal, unusable, and usable attributes. Right? Is that clear? So let's see. I'll say print dir of str1. str1 is an object. So dir, dir is applied to an object. So DIR lists all the internal usable and unusable attributes of that class from which the object belongs to. The class to which the object belongs to. So the object str1 belongs to which class? String class, right? So DIR will list down all the attributes associated with the string class. Is that clear? Right? Likewise, if I say print DIR, let's say N1. N1 is of which class? N1 is an object of complex class, right? So if I say DIR N1, it prints out all the attributes of complex class. Because all the objects supposed to, I mean, like all the objects, they obviously get all the properties of a class, right? <laughs> yes or no? <clears throat> you see this? 
Now, when I said internal and unusable, and also the usable attributes, if you can look at it for string, for example, the one which I have selected, they all are usable by the user. The remaining attributes have dunders. Those are enclosed by double underscores. Yes or no? Just imagine it like this. You're trying to fill a form, any form. And that form has a place where you can write something. And the very form will also have a place which says for office use only, right? You are not supposed to write anything there, right? So likewise, anything under dunders, I was explaining that to you yesterday when we were uh, discussing about the syntax rules. Anything enclosed within double underscores should not be used by the user. They have a different meaning. It's used by Python internal codes, right? So you don't have to touch it. You, you don't have any rights to touch it. Clear with that? Now, what I have selected, these functions can be used by the user. So yesterday we have done few things, right? We had said str one dot, let's say, for example, uh, lower. Well, what is this function doing? Converting everything into lower class, see? Lower case, sorry, right? So this function is usable. I hope that is clear. So when you're, when you're pressing the tab, when you're getting this list, can you see anything under, uh, can you see any of those double underscore functions? No, right? We can't see them. They are internal objects. Is that clear? But what you can see is something which you can use. And DIR lists all the usable and unusable functions and attributes. Is it clear to everyone? Now this one is for a complex number, conjugate, imaginary, real. So if I say n1 dot real, so it is printing 5.0, which is its real part. Or n1 dot imaginary, it is printing the imaginary part, which is 6. Clear? Is this point clear to everyone? Online guys? The DIR function, is it clear to everyone? Online guys? Yeah, you must remember one thing here. Attribute doesn't necessarily mean that it's a function. Attribute can be a variable, attribute can be a function. So string dot lower, lower is a function n1 dot imag image imaginary so that's not a function right i have not used a parenthesis for it i'm not calling it i'm directly using it if you're wondering how do i know this right how do you know something is a function and something is not a function just remember there are two ways of doing it and please pay attention way number one getting help so how do you get help? Just use a question mark sign. That is how you get help. So if you say question mark str one dot, let's say lower. Question mark str one dot lower. Or simply, I'm not, I'm not using any function or anything. When I run it, see, it is showing me the help, the doc string. Return a copy of the string s converted to lowercase. That's it. Clear with this, right? Or when I say question mark n1 dot image, what it is doing? Convert? No, 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 no. One second. Yeah, because this is not a function, you're not getting any doc string for that. But yes, you can get a help using question mark sign and you can understand whether it is a function or an attribute. Yes, that you can do. Second one, the error, the error message. So 
when we use a variable as function we get an error message let's say n1 dot image or n1 dot real n1 dot real is not a function right if i'm using this as if i'm using a function i'll get an error it says object is not callable so and so object is not callable right so what is that error message so so and so object is not callable if you're getting that error message you can automatically think that that particular attribute is not a function it's rather a value some floating point value like this error message says right it's a floating point so float object is not callable is that clear what was this last point about so how do you identify whether an attribute is a function or a value so what you will do is every attribute use use as if you are using a function if it works then well and good if it gives you an error which says something is not callable then it's an attribute don't use it as a function also the actual method of doing it is getting a help use question mark you can get a help about that particular function is that clear right now let's look at uh, what are the attributes for a tuple how do i do that print dir any tuple object right so how many uh, attributes are present which are usable only two so tap one dot count right this takes one number as input returns its frequency it takes one number as input and it returns its frequency so i can say tap one dot count let's say 10 Oh, sorry. Tap one dot count ten. So how many times ten is present? Twice. Let's check that. Yes, ten is present here, and ten is also present here. All right. So this is what count does. And what is the other one? Tap one dot index. So this also takes number as an input. returns its first occurrence index number so top one dot index let's say 10 10 is occurring in the zeroth index for the first time or let's say 23 for example where is 23 occurring first index let's say 23 is also present somewhere else it will only return the first appearance is that clear these are the two functions available for a tuple right all right how do you see what the function is doing very good uh guys can any can anyone answer that question how do you see what a function is doing can you see what is the uh, uh meaning of that function or you know definition of the function how do you how do you we do that by using question mark so question mark top one dot count so say it takes one value as an input and returns an integer number of occurrences of that value right so is there any way to take the what arguments on many attributes to be yeah same thing uh, uh, question mark see it says t1 dot count value so value is the input it takes only one argument right or for example uh, let me do something for string str 1 dot let's say format for example so if i want to invoke help of it it says like how many arguments it is taking like this is not that clear but anyways so uh, the, the main idea is that so question mark gives you all the help right okay. str1.count so what is the starting point what is the ending point it returns an integer things like that 
here I'm about to give you a task actually, which is not part of your assignments, but yes, uh, if you do this, it will be of your additional help. There's a task for you. How do I print all the attributes of strings? Print all the attributes of a string. How do I do that? How do I print all the attributes of a string object? Find the length of the string. Attributes. Print DIR. Print DIR. So that's simply print DIR, let's say str1, right? Now that you have already done, the second task is create a create a string, right? And execute all the attribute functions on that string. So whatever is the attribute functions available for a string, try executing it on that particular string. It can be upper, lower, capitalize, count, substring, int string, all the attributes available for you. Right? Write a small description. Write a small description of what you have observed. A description of the outputs. What, what you have observed? What, what, what happened when you had applied capitalize? What is the difference between like capitalized upper and lower? What is each decimal doing? What is each integer doing? Right? What is each string doing? Right? You can also, you can uh, take the help utility. Take the help of the question mark utility. Right? So if you are stuck somewhere, if you don't know, if you're not sure, how to use the function, you can use the question mark for that. With this exercise, I want uh, two things. My aim is two things. One, you should get acquainted with how to invoke help from the Python notebook. That's my first aim. Second aim is you must know a thing or two about the strings. Right? It's highly essential for us for text mining. So that should begin from here. So please do these tasks. Clear? Online guys, I hope everybody understood uh, what are the task questions, what are the questions here. All right. Rajesh, very good question there again. Really nice question though. So the question is, we had seen like we extracted first four, last four elements as such. How do you extract randomly? I mean, like, if not exact, his, his question was how do you extract middle four? But my question would be how do you randomly extract elements? How do you randomly extract elements from a tuple? So let's do that. Let's do that. So directly it is not possible. There is a small logic that we have to think about it. Now I want everyone to start thinking about it along with me. Come on. Yeah, you can't use comma. I think you use comma, and that's the most easiest thing, right? <laughs> okay, let's do that. So let's say my situation is extract zeroth element, third element, uh, fourth element, ninth element, eleventh, and fourteen. All random, right? There is no sequence, right? Can anyone give me an idea how to do this? I can't use square brackets. I can't use colon. I can't use anything. I'll have to use loops. Now tell me how do I do it using loops? Pardon? Randint? No, there's no function called randint. It's NumPy. So you want to extract 0, 3, 4, and then 14 Yes, exactly. So we can put this and numbers in a list. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's a really nice thinking. Exactly, Anil. This is what you guys are saying, it right? Let's do that. So please listen. What I'll do is the positions that I am intending to extract, I'll put them in a tuple. So I'll say for i in that tuple, right? I can do that, right? Now, what will I do? I'll say print top one square brackets i. That's it. Simple as that. Clear with us? Everyone?
so this is equally dynamic right <laughs> so what do you understand by dynamically why are you using square brackets we are using square brackets because my intention is the i in these elements 0 3 4 9 11 14 these are not exact values these are index values right so index values are supposed to be put in your square brackets right so then only you can get the elements now what is the bigger picture of all these things i mean like yes you have now understood each and every part of tuple now in few minutes you'll understand everything about list and then further dictionary what's the bigger picture here why are we doing this to extract elements yes of course why are we doing all these things what's the need of this i'll tell you what imagine a table imagine a table let's say an employee table an employee table will have a lot of columns a column called employee id a column called employee name let's say age or maybe date of birth, date of joining, number of years with the company, what is the department in which that particular employee is working, what is the gender of that employee, right? So you have got a lot of information, right? In a table, how many dimensions are there in a table? How many dimensions are there in a table? Two dimensions, right? Rows and columns. Yes or no? Imagine all the columns, like, this let's say the, the, this table has 20 columns separate all the 20 columns just like imagine them everything separate but these columns are your one dimensional data structure and a table is a collection of multiple one dimensional objects is that clear so in python when we are having tables we don't we don't have tables in basic python we are getting tables by the virtue of pandas. So in pandas, when you get tables, those tables, which are two dimensional, they're actually combination of multiple one dimensional data structures. Hence, we must have a control over all the one dimensional data structures. And this is how you have those controls, right? This is our foundation for having, you know, the control over our one dimensional data structures. Is that clear to everyone? Yes. That's why we are doing this. That's the bigger picture here. So maybe by next Sunday, when we are discussing NumPy, Pandas, Pandas series, Pandas data frame, then we will understand, yes, I know this. I know how to do this. Because at that time, I'll be discussing about data manipulation. And when discussing data manipulations, this is the technicality of it. Now that will make sense now. That will connect the dots, right? As of now, I'm just putting the dots. We have not connected the dots yet. Is that clear? Now let's go. Let's discuss about lists now. Lists, lists is also one dimensional heterogeneous data structure. We have to discuss how to create, how to create list. How do you access elements how do you apply conditions and number four what are the functions associated with the lists right let's first see how to create it how did we create a tuple I'm just copying the tuple code here. So instead of tuple, I'm now creating a list. How did we create a tuple? Which brackets did we use for a tuple? Round brackets, right? For lists, square brackets, fantastic. So we use square brackets to create lists. Is that clear? So what is type of L1? Type of L1 is supposed to be a list, right? Range 0, 10, 1, right? When I was doing this, what was I actually doing? 
I'm converting that into a list. I was converting the range. We convert the range into a list. That's it. In Python 3. In Python 3.x. If you are using Python 2.x, range function directly gives a list. Remember that. If you are using Python 2, range function will directly give a list. In Python 3, Python 3, the range function will not directly give you the numbers. It will generate some numbers and put it internally. If you want it as a list, you can use list function. Or if you want it as a tuple, you can use tuple function. Tuple range 0, 10, 1. So you have a tuple here. There is a difference there, right? List and tuple. Yes? So I hope the creation of list is clear. And now I think the air around this list function is also clear, right? List is a function which converts a given data structure into a list. And likewise, we have a tuple function as well. Tuple function converts a given uh, data structure into a tuple. Clear? Again, for example, I have tup1. What is tup1? What is the data type? What, what, what is the type of tup1? Type of tup1. Tup1 is a tuple, right? Can I convert this tuple into a list? Yes. Yes, yes I can do that. So how do we convert? How to convert tuple tup1 into list? How do you do that? List of tup1. Fantastic. That converts an existing tuple into a list. Is it clear to everyone? And vice versa. If you have a, a list, how do you convert it into tuple? Use tuple function. Clear with this? Now, how do you extract elements? Simple. Use the square brackets as we did for tuples. Use the square brackets as we did for tuples. Pratyu shall come to that if you can just have some patience and wait for it. Clear? So, L1 square brackets 4. What is it extracting? Fifth element. Or element with index number 4. Right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Happens to be my fifth element. Now, I'm not going to write everything. Whatever we have written for top 1, so when you are practicing it, just replace that with list L1. That's it. Right? Now, apply conditions. Applying conditions. That is also exactly the same, but there is a slight difference. Please pay attention. How do you apply conditions? How did we do that for a tuple? Uh, get elements from L1 that are greater than 30 and less than 80, for example. Right? Let's do that. How do we do for a tuple? We will do this exact same thing for lists. So as a for i in list L1, right? If i greater than 30 and i less than 80, print i. That's it. Simple. Yes? Now. Everyone, now please pay attention to something called list comprehension. Please pay attention to this list comprehension. Square brackets x. What does this mean? There is some element x. So, like square brackets 1. What does that mean? I'm creating a list with an element called one with one single element called one or like let's say square brackets 10 what are we creating here we're creating a list with one element that is 10 now i'll say square bracket x where is this x coming from for example let's say this x is coming from l1 so let's say x coming from l1 
So how do I express this properly in form of a code? Please look at it. X for X in L1. Make sense? X for X in L1. What does this mean? So if I run this, what, what I'll get? I'll get a new list which contains all the elements of list L1. Yes or no? That is what is happening here, right? X for X in L1 means what is it happening? All the elements from list L1. Now, if I do something like this, X square for X in L1, what is this giving me? Every number is getting squared. Or let me do one more example. X plus is equals to 2, 4 or X uh, multiplication is equals to 10 for X in L1. What is this doing? Uh, x is equals to x into 10. Does it work? Why not? Why? Okay, sorry. x multiplied by 10 for x in L1. Is that clear? What is this happening? Every x fetching being fetched from L1 is being multiplied by 10. Right? But this is list comprehension. I hope everybody understood this. Yes. To apply anything, any kind of operation on all the elements of list, instead of imagining it using a for loop, you can do a list comprehension like this. If you have to substitute this with a for loop, you would have done something like for i in L1, print i multiplied by 10. This is what we would have imagined, right? But no, directly we can write a comprehension like this. Is that clear? So let's apply condition using list comprehension. Everyone, please pay attention here. X for X in L1. If, if X greater than 30 and X less than 80. Is this clear? What I've done here? If I can break down, I'm just putting brackets here. Bracket number one, bracket number two. This code has three parts this x that is the first part second part explains where is this x coming from the third part explains what is x actually right so yeah of course i uh, bracket is not an allowed syntax i'm just writing this for your explanation is that clear this is what this code is all about so x for x in l1 if x greater than 30 and x less than 80. So everybody understood what is the list comprehension? What is the output? A new list. A new list because you have put a list here, right? See, I have enclosed everything in a bracket, which means it's a list. Is this clear to everyone? And this works only for list. It can't work in a tuple. There's nothing called tuple comprehension. It's called list comprehension, right? Is this clear online guys? I hope everyone is able to follow this. <coughs> is this clear? Viplav, Vishakha, Uttam, Terran, Tony, Tejeshwar. Is this clear guys? Shabbir, Sandeep, Siddharth. Is this clear to everyone? All right. Now, Next up, what are the attributes? Uh, thanks everyone for having that patience to wait. Now the one thing which is ringing in your head since we started list, what's the difference between list and tuple? Why do you have two things? Right? Let's understand that. And then we'll go to what are the attributes? So difference between list and tuple. And the reason why I'm doing this, despite the fact that we'll not be using list and tuple anywhere in our data science that extensively, yes, list will be used, but not tuple. The reason why we are doing this is some of these questions are a part of your interview questions, right? Because like, see, somehow or the other, like if, if someone is experienced in a programming language, you can also show Python as a minor part of your experience as well. 
the, the kind of exposure that you'll get here with all the projects and all, you might show Python as your experience so that you get a little bit more preference over others, right? That's a that, that that's not uh, that's a legitimate thing to do actually, right? If you know programming, you know any programming language. That's the rule, right? So in that case, they would definitely ask you these questions. These trivial questions will definitely be asked to you. So you just know. If you know, it's better. Actually, that's it. That's the reason why we are doing this. But that doesn't mean that it requires extensive research from your side. No, not required. You don't have to spend much time and energy in this. Just understand whatever we are doing in this class. This boundary is enough for list, tuple, and dictionary. Not beyond that, right? Okay, let's do. What's the difference between list and a tuple? Now, L1 square brackets for what is the answer? What is the I to reassign the value and from 43 let's change it to let's say triple six for example from 43 let's try to change it to triple six can we do that yes we can do that l1 square brackets 4 equals to triple six now let's look at l1 Oh, no, the 43 doesn't exist now. It exists now. 43 is gone and we have triple six here instead of 43, right? We have triple six in the position number four, right? Let's do that for tuple. Okay. For tuple, okay. we can't. See, T1, top one, square brackets, four equal to triple six. Now this shows an error. Tuple object does not support item assignment, which translates to tuple is, yes, tuple is read only. Is that clear? That's the difference between tuple and a list. Here I want you to introduce, I want to introduce about one concept called mutable and immutable object. Nothing complicated, just listen one thing very simple when you create a object when you create an element a simple element like x is equals to 10 when you're creating this imagine a two column table in fact that two column table is your ram because variables are being stored in ram right so ram is actually your two column table column number one contains an index number or a position number or memory id what is that? Memory ID. And column number two contains the value. X is equal to 10. X is being assigned some memory location. Yes. Everybody agrees to that. And in that memory uh, location, we'll have the value 10. Again, everyone agrees to this. Yes. X will get a memory location over there. 10 will be stored. Is that clear? Fantastic. Let's get the location. What's the location or memory ID? So for that, we'll be using a function called ID. ID of X. See, it will give me some memory location. I have a 16 gig RAM, so that extends up to 2 power 16. I don't know. Let's 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 not discuss that now. So this is a number. This is where X is present. One second. One second. One second. One second. One second. So these things. So this memory location, right? This memory location. This value X. This X is totally immutable. What does what does immutable mean? Cannot be changed. The value, the value in X cannot be changed. But that's not the case, right? When I'm saying X is equals to X multiplied by 10, print X, you're definitely seeing a change in the value, right? But why did I say it is immutable? 
the value of x cannot be changed in the same memory id now what does that translate to whenever you are changing the value of x which means that the memory location will also change right right so now let's look at the new memory location of x id of x is now something different see this and this are different they are not equal are they no they are not equal 3536416 they are totally separate right so your memory id changed now the value has changed the memory id has changed now x got shifted to some other location with a new value and with a new memory id is that clear so that's what it is and no there are no concepts of pointers in python a primitive language like c has it but not python but these are your memory locations and an immutable object cannot be changed in the same memory location is that clear tuple is immutable pardon no 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 there is no x so that x got freed exactly. that x got destroyed x is equals to 10 that no longer exists right what is our new x our new x is x is equals to 100 that goes into this new location and so that memory location freed up we don't know what happens to that <coughs> maybe some y came in right we don't know what happened to that now we can have like just how you have the concept of pointers in c you can't use this to extract the elements no you can't do that in python not possible right i hope you have understood the difference between immutable and immutable objects right tuple is immutable in fact all your primitive data types all are immutable tuple is considered to be one among the primitives so your primitive data types and data structures like str int float boolean or in python 2 long and tuple they all are immutable is that clear now that's the difference between tuple and the list now let's see what are the attributes of list how do i do it print dir l1 so look at this append what what, what do you understand by append we can add in the end insert what does that mean now add anywhere in the middle copy create a copy of the list count we have seen count in tuple right extend extend as in concatenate right so extend what it does is it takes two lists list one list two if you want to extend list one l1 dot extend l2 So L two also gets added to L one, or just listen to this. Let's say I have a list called L two, where I have got some numbers, right? Let's say I have L three. Here I have got some alphabets. Right? I can concatenate these two. Listen up, L one. Plus, sorry, L two plus L three. What will happen? A list concatenation, right? Same goes with extend. Index we have seen in tuple as well. Same goes here, right? Insert, pop, pop and remove. Pop by default removes the last element, but if you put put the index, it will remove element from the given index. Remove. will remove the first occurrence of a given number if i say remove 43 or if i say remove 666 let's say 666 is present more than twice more than once it will remove the first occurrence of 666 reverse as in this change the order first element becomes last element and so on sort sorting in ascending or descending order now i have given you one task task 1 right about strings please do that for list as well right i hope you will be able to do that clear all right so that's the difference between list and a tuple clear with us now let's try to understand the next one set and dictionary set i'll also discuss dictionary along with this
How many brackets have you left with now? Curly braces. So how do you create set in a dictionary? Using curly braces. So what is a set in mathematics? Exactly, exactly. Uh, excellent. I mean, like, it's a group. It's a group of elements. But there is one word here which one must never forget. Group of unique. Group of unique elements. Group of unique elements. So that is what is a set is all about, right? There are no repetitions in set whatsoever. If you all remember that, right? So let's see. I want to create a set S1 and say S1 is equals to, let's say I'm randomly inserting numbers. What do you think will be the output? What are they? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's it. That's a set. No repetitions. Where will you use set? That's up to you. I mean, like, I have not seen any practical uses of set, but yes, it exists. That's the reason why I have told you this. Clear with this? Right? Oh, let's say there is a categorical variable. Let's say a variable called department. So imagine department as a list. You want all the unique elements in that department. So convert it into set. And when you print it, you'll finally get all unique elements. That's one way how to get unique elements. So set can be, I mean, like, can also be used to get number of unique elements, right? Yes? Now, let's look at dictionary. So there is nothing much to discuss about this, uh, about the set. Let's look at now dictionary. Dictionary is also created using curly braces, but there is a slight difference. All the computer science guys, just tell me, what is a hash table? Key and value, right? Hash table is a table with key value pair, right? A dictionary is a 1D data structure similar to a hash table. It contains key column value pairs, key and value pairs, right? So that's a dictionary, right? Now, uh, here there is no concept of what? Index. Fantastic. There's no concept of index. There is key, there is value. If you want to get value, get it through the key. To get a value, to fetch your value, we need to know its key. Is that clear? Right? Let's create a dictionary. So the generic syntax is curly braces, key one, colon, value one. key 2, value 2, key 3, value 3, and so on. Right? Clear? Let's do that. So I'll say dict1 is equals to curly braces. So let's say like, uh, all right, maths, let's say somebody scored 55, uh, physics, let's say that person scored 86. Chemistry, let's say that person scored 60, something. Uh, English, let's say 82. No, these are not my marks. Uh, let's just, uh, tell you one more subject, economics. Uh, let's say somebody scored like uh, 90. So this is your dictionary. Dict one contains these elements, right? Is that clear? How do you extract 63 out of it? You can't say dict one square brackets three. Do you? No, you can't. You'll have to know the corresponding key, right? 
you need to know the key what is the key then you can get the corresponding value because it's a key value pair right all right so that's your dictionary so let's uh, know some rules keys what is the first obvious rule of a key fantastic keys must be unique if i ask you what if it is not unique what might happen so you'll not get any error that's for sure if the key is not yes the latest one gets the uh, preference so the latest one overrides all the previous entries like for example if i'm creating dict2 and again i'm putting something called maths the exact same key right so maths colon let's say 90 right well it was always my dream to get that much score in mathematics which i couldn't get it and then, and then the irony is i'm teaching you stats so you see this last mathematics got overwritten here right see that prevails oh hello the uh, best part of all this entire story my mathematics story is yeah i don't know maths i'm scared about maths but somehow i did statistics i'm working as a data scientist the best part is my mom's a maths teacher and my dad is my uh, dad is a banker so they always say that like uh, the uh, police ka beta chor hota hai so somewhat like that Anyhow, the second rule is it can be a string like we are using here. It can be a string or a number or an integer. You can put an integer as an index or a floating point. It can't be a boolean for God's sake, right? It can be a string, integer, or a floating point. Clear with this? Yes. Third thing must not be a list or a tuple. A key cannot be a list or a tuple. You can't have a tuple as a key or a list as a key. Clear with this? What are the rules for values? What are the rules for values? There's no rules for values. Values can be anything. Right? Values can be anything. But keys should follow some rules. Clear? Now, how do you extract elements? So, dict1, for example, this is my dict1. So dict one square brackets within quotes maths. So I, I need to write the exact spelling. So I'll get the element out of it. Extract all key names. How do I do that? Dict one dot keys. Sorry, that's a function, right? So dict one dot keys. It's a function, right? I should give a call. What's your answer? So all the keys are being returned. Clear? This is being written as a list. No, 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 no. If we want this as a list, we have to say list function dict one dot keys. Right? Python two directly gives a list. Python two directly gives a list. Clear? And same ways, extract all values. Dict one dot values. Right? So everything will be in a corresponding order. Yes? And if you guys are still using Python 2, which is fine, I mean, you will not find the dictionary getting created in the way how you have passed it. Here, the dictionary is getting created in the exact order in which I have passed it, right? In Python 2, it doesn't happen. 
dictionary automatically gets sorted while displaying when displaying it automatically gets sorted in the way in the alphabetical order of its keys that happens in python 2 if you happen to come across any example which is written in python 2 if you're seeing dictionary not being present in the way how you have created it it means it's python 2 and it is sorting in the, in, in in the ascending order of its keys but in python 3 that's not the case as you can see on my screen now right it gets created in the order in which you are passing it same goes with the lists which contains keys and values both the lists are corresponding in nature right guys both the lists are corresponding in nature right this is how it works now again what is the purpose of a dictionary everybody heard about this term called dummy data so what happens is whenever you are doing anything whenever you are doing any kind of stats or anything you always want want to have some example data with you right you want to quickly create one example data to show to test out few things right dictionary is used to create that kind of a dummy data in your system right I, i'll give you an example let's say we want to create a dictionary that contains all employee details so let's create that i'm creating something called emp dict employee dictionary how do i create a dictionary curly braces so i'll have the columns called employee id i'll have employee name e name i'll have something called salary that's it and let's have something called date of joining right what are these these are your keys let's say my values are some lists i am passing list as my value i can pass it right my keys must not be a list but my values can be a list is that right or wrong that's correct right i hope everyone is able to understand what i'm trying to do here so let's create some employee ids like 1122 for example 4433 Clear? Let's create some names. Give me some names, please. Come on, give me some names. Vijay. Vijay. Okay. Dimalia. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that must not be named. Yeah. yeah. Santosh. Santosh. Okay. Good name. Anything else? Come on. Avinash. Let's pick one randomly from online. Online guys, give me some names. <laughs> Rajesh. Okay, let's pick Rajesh. Oh, one second. Uh, let's delete one name because there has to be gender equality, right? So, <laughs> come on, give me some names. Anu. Yeah, one more. Ashish, who is Rekha? <laughs> How many employee IDs have taken? Five, right? Let's add one more. Let's add Vishakha as well. Yeah, just for gender equality. Yeah, okay, okay. So yeah, six males, six female, uh, three males, three females, right? That, that's that's balance, right? Okay, now let's put up salaries. Don't worry, that four-figure salary is in dollars. So <laughs> <laughs> let's give uh, yeah six. Do I have six or more than six? That's fine, right? Date of joining, not date of birth, so it, it's fine. Uh, just copy this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right? So I'll just change some of these dates. Uh, Feb. 
March, April, 15th, May. What I've done here, I've taken four, uh, what do you say, like your, what do you call that? Keys. I'm taking lists, all the lists are of equal size, right? I'm creating a dictionary. Just make sure every every uh, list is of equal size, yes. From this, I can create a table, right? So I have this EMP dict. This EMP dict can be converted to table later. Is that clear? How to do it? Let's understand that later. I'll just write the code. Now I'll write the code, how to convert this dictionary into table. But what is that code? We can understand that later. That's not for discussion now, right? But I'll just write the code to just to complete this example. That's it. Just to explain you how dictionaries can be used in future. So what should I import? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all these things I'll explain you later. Don't worry. I'll do that later. It's a huge package, so it takes some time to load. You know, I'll write the table. EMP data is equals to yeah, pandas dot data frame EMP dict. That's it. So you have got your EMP data. Right? You have got a table with you, a dummy data with you. Clear with this? This is how dummy data is created using dictionary. And this is the importance of dictionary, what we have in data science. Clear with this? Every one of you, all right? Okay, so what have we discussed till now, right from the beginning? Your syntax rules yesterday, yes? Syntax rules, conditionals, loops, list, upper end, dictionary, right? So, yes, I know, like, uh, we have had a good enough start for Python, right? So this week, what's your target is, you must familiarize yourself with the Jupyter Notebook, right? How we have done everything in Jupyter Notebook, you should be able to do that in Jupyter Notebooks. Write your own descriptions, whatever you're doing. That's a very good thing to revise. In fact, I would go ahead and say like the uh, text document that I'm about to share with you. So just, uh, you can either copy paste or write it in your own words for your own practice and put it in Jupyter Notebooks. Now, yesterday, how we have seen like you have understood how to save a Jupyter notebook, right? What is the file format in which it gets saved? IPYNB, right? It gets saved in the format of IPYNB, IPython, Interactive Python Notebook. Now, I have to tell you two things about file formats. IPYNB is Jupyter notebook, but what is the actual format of a python code dot py right can we export this as a py file absolutely we can now everyone pay attention how to do that please go to file please uh, click on download as i have got a lot of options here right so if i want to download it as dot py file it gets downloaded as py file in any location let me keep it in E drive DSP classes, DSP class one, for example, right? Now what I have here is a .py file. So if I can just open it with a notepad. One second. Uh, see, this is your entire .py file. So all your uh, Jupyter related uh, things that we have written, this got converted into comments. You see that? Your markdown got commented into, uh, uh, got converted into comments. Only the code remains as code. See, whatever things we have written, see, everything got converted into comments, all the notes that we have written, but your code, it stays as code, <laughs> right? You can do that. You can also, you can also download this as a HTML document. So just go to file, download as HTML. 
same thing so if if you can open it with any other web browser so you'll get this output this is of course not editable right this will not be editable but yes you have an output here but if you want a pdf that is not directly possible you need to install one software called latex text latex must be installed i have not installed it in my system but you guys can just do it so slides or maybe like file download as latex or pdf i think that's not possible yeah that's not possible because i need a software actually so i need this software to be installed right once i install that software then it will work right yes the output i think output is not getting exported along with it i guess so only the comments and uh, your markdown they are getting exported i think the output is not getting exported right no the output is not getting exported only the uh, command is getting exported and the comments are getting exported dict2 maths okay so what is dict2 actually yeah here we go this is dict2 right dict2 square brackets maths it gives 90 of course it will give 90 right <coughs> excuse me all right guys let's stop here